So hello, hello everybody. Quick show of hands, who here is a Ruby programmer? That's good, this is a Ruby meetup, so you are in the right place. How many of you are Rails programmers in particular? Pretty much the same people, so I think, I think this talk will be pretty timely. Uh, so it's called What's New in Rails 6 and the Future of the Ecosystem. So it's about not just what's new in Rails technically, but what's new in sort of the broader process and landscape that we're in today. Uh, I was kind of tempted to call this talk, Is Rails Dead Yet? <laughs> but I think that joke's been pretty overdone by now. So of course I'm gonna use it later in the presentation. Uh, but seriously, here's what we'll be talking about tonight. Let's see here, we've got a brief introduction, who I am, uh, how we got here in the space-time continuum, no, really, as Rails programmers, uh, we'll talk about down to the, the nitty-gritties of what's in Rails 6. 6 is one more than 5, so that's cool. Uh, then we'll have a little wrap-up like a burrito, and then a uh, little break uh, at the end of the talk before we get into a couple lightning talks. Uh, so uh, who I am, just a little introduction. Uh, my name is Jared White, and I'm the founder and lead rupeeist at White Fusion, which is a boutique web studio here in Portland. So I work with a variety of clients, a lot of Rails apps, some Jekyll-based websites, uh, doing more with React these days, which is interesting, but at heart I am a Rubyist. And uh, you can find me on Twitter, at Jared C. White, on Mastodon. I run my own Mastodon server, which is pretty fun. Uh, that's the, the open web federated social network equivalent to Twitter, if you will. Uh, yeah, and then uh, my Ruby on Rails history, I. I forget exactly what the current version was when I got into, into it, but it was basically the version two of Rails back in 2008. Uh, and even before that, I've been in this, this web game since 97, if you can believe it. I was the proverbial teenager in the bedroom, hacking away on little HTML projects and everything was new and fresh and kind of stumbled into the fact that I could actually make money doing that. <laughs> so that was, that was a good thing. Uh, so, as I was working on this presentation, uh, oh, by the way, uh, if you end up not being able to hear me in the back very well, just speak up and get my attention. I'll, I'll try to talk loudly. Um, but as I was putting this presentation together, it, it really dawned on me that in many ways, I, I owe my livelihood today to essentially three companies. You can probably already guess what those companies might be, but I'll, uh, I'll run down here. Basecamp, Shopify, and GitHub. But not just because of their contributions to Rails, it goes even beyond that. So let's turn back the clock. Ooh. Uh, so on December 13th, 2005, DHH, David Hennemeyer Hansen released version one, the official version one of Ruby on Rails. In, to in 2006, Toby Lutka released Liquid, which is a nice little template engine that is Ruby based that you can use in all sorts of situations where you need a safe template language for your website. Uh, he built it so that he could use it with Shopify. This, this little startup he was just starting to put out there into the world. More on that in a moment. And then in 2008, Tom Preston Warner, who's the founder of GitHub, he was fed up with WordPress. He wanted some kind of lightweight little system that he could use to build his blog. He wanted it to be really based on a, on a Git style workflow for obvious reasons. And so he built this static site generator called Jekyll and it used the liquid template engine interestingly enough. So fast forward to today, on any given day of my typical work week, I'm just as likely to be working on a website using Jekyll as I am an application using Rails. But in either case, 
because of this sort of constellation, this, this ecosystem that emerged in the late 2000s, uh, I, I really owe so much of what I'm able to do today to these three companies. Uh, and one other thing that's cool, guess which companies are the top contributors in, in terms of large commercial companies, uh, top contributors to Rails version six and even beyond as we look to the future. Basecamp, Shopify, GitHub. <laughs> so yeah, they, they've been around a while and they're still here and still going for it. And the crazy thing is they are all, all three of them are running off of Rails master. So essentially that means that as Rails is developing like practically in real time, day by day, week by week, they are keeping their production systems like upgraded and running all their tests and making sure everything's working and everything's fast and performant. And so uh, this is really great news for us as Rails developers because that means that you know we, we can have a, a fair degree of confidence that if we build something in Rails today or we have legacy code we're trying to upgrade and you know trying to evaluate Rails as a platform like you know. Shopify, GitHub, <laughs> they're on the latest version, they're pushing it forward, that's pretty cool. Something even cooler than that perhaps is, uh, well, we all know that Amazon is the largest retailer here in America, for better or for worse, uh, so they're huge, you might even say they're huge, but you know who the second largest e-commerce platform in America is? It's Shopify, yay! Actually, it's, it's still eBay, but uh, Shopify's like on a fast ramp and, and analysts in the know are predicting that by the end of the year, Shopify will be number two. Kinda, kinda mind blowing. Uh, but seriously, why does this matter to us here and now? I think I kinda said that. It's all about you know, confidence in where this technology is going. I still remember the dark days, it was like, 2014 into 2015, you'd go on the sites and you know these like tech Q&A sites and be like, question, is Rails dying? And the answer was, yes, you should switch to Node.js and build everything in Angular, which was version one. Uh, and we all know how that turned out with Google's complete rewrite of Angular. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, a little crazy over there. Getting better though. Uh, but thankfully Rails did not in fact die as we've seen. Um, you know, not only with everything that these, these companies have been doing with pushing Rails forward, but uh, you know, since 2015 we've had a whole string of really solid releases. Rails 5, Rails 5.1 introduced Webpacker, which is really huge because it kind of brought the entire Rails ecosystem into playing nicely with this modern world of JavaScript tooling, uh, 5.2, and of course Rails 6. Uh, and then it's probably a little hard to read all those things, but basically, long story short, GitHub had to go through this several year long, like crazy endeavor to go from this very weird fork of Rails 3.2, which was patched up the wazoo with all this stuff that nobody could really figure out, uh, and, and get everything sort of ported over to stock rails. So that's where they are now. Uh, Eileen at Eileen Codes on Twitter just led this really amazing effort at GitHub to get everything modern and current. And so now they're contributing like gangbusters to the Rails code base. So arguably Rails is in the best shape it's ever been, which I'm very happy about. We can all rejoice. All right, let's get into it. Wait, did, was there a, there we go. Yes, let's dive into Rails 6. Time to peek under the hood. I would say the best feature of Rails 6 is that thanks to the new action mailbox framework, uh, Rails is now fully compliant with Zawinski's law, which if you're not familiar, every program attempts to expand until it can read mail. <laughs> that which can also expand is replaced by one that can, so. <laughs> All right, seriously though, best new real 
best new features of Rails 6. Uh, we have a, 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 a sort of a, a little cluster of marquee features and then some little more esoteric things, but it's all good. So uh, just a quick summary, uh, there's now support for multiple databases right out of the box. So if you have a really large product, a lot of servers, large code base, and you're having problems scaling, uh, this could, could really be a lifesaver. Uh, we have Action Mailbox, which I'll get into a tiny bit, but we have a lightning talk later by Wilfred that will go into the nitty gritty of that. Uh, Action Text, which lets you interact with uh, rich text content in your application, uh, both for authoring and presenting it. Um, there's a new uh, facility for running your tests in, in parallel, so you can have you know, a bunch of tests running all utilizing your large multi-core CPU farms and all that. Um, Action Cable has been rewritten in ES6, so goodbye CoffeeScript. Uh, so it's, that's been modernized and there's a bunch of new testing tools for that. Uh, we have Webpacker on by default, so Sprockets is kind of fading away now, except maybe for managing like image assets and you can still use it for CSS if you want, but I kind of recommend everyone just for JavaScript and CSS go with Webpacker. Uh, Zwork is a brand new autoloader, I'll touch on that in a, a little bit later as well, and there's just a ton of enhancements and goodies and things which I won't have time to go into today, uh, but uh, if you go onto the rubyonrails.org site, they have release notes and upgrade guides and all that good stuff. Um, so we'll, we'll touch on all of these starting with, oh, and uh, one thing that's coming soon to Rails 6.1 is Action View Component. Uh, and I'll briefly mention that as well, because I think that's going to be a really, really cool enhancement to the, the standard Rails way of building out your view layer. I could watch this GIF all day, I don't know why, <laughs> I just think it's funny. <laughs> all right, so starting with multiple databases. So a typical config YAML file looks something like this. This is just the production block. You know, you usually have like development, test, maybe staging, and then production. It's just, you know, database, database, database. Very simple. Uh, but now it can look like this. You can just go nuts. <laughs> databases everywhere. Uh, but yeah, the idea is that you know you can start with a primary database and then you can add a replica database and then you could add another database for a particular you know subset of your models. So like here there's like an animals database that's just for the animals part of your, your domain logic and that can have a replica. Uh, and so the way that works is you know, we're all familiar with the, with the base class that you, you get right out of the box with Rails. You have, you know, application record, which is a, a subclass of uh, action database. No, action model database? Anyway, something like, no, active record base, that's it. Uh, so the, this animals base subclasses application record, and you, you know, specify, like, I want you know, anything that inherits from this base class, you use this database for reading and this database for writing. And so then when you define an active record model, like say dog, uh, you inherit from this specific base class. Uh, and then when you, you know, set up your migrations, you specify that database. So instead of using, you know, your primary database, you can use this animals database. Uh, there's a whole ton of new stuff in Active Record besides just multiple database support, and um, we'll have uh, uh, Jason doing a, a, a lightning talk on that in just a little bit. I feel like I'm switching like two slides in a row here. Okay, here we go. Action Mailbox. So this is a new framework in Rails 6 that lets you process incoming mail. Uh, and we're gonna have a lightning talk on that by Wilfred later. So just very briefly, you can write code that routes incoming mail to some particular mailbox. You can create a new mailbox with a, with a Rails command like you would create a new model or a new controller or whatever. Uh, and, and then in, in any given mailbox, you can you know, take whatever mail gets routed into it and do something like create a new record or whatever. 
pretty cool. Action text is a new framework that uses tricks. So if, if you've used Basecamp 3 at all, uh, the, the rich text editor in there for editing documents or messages, uh, that uses Trix. Trix has been an open source uh, JavaScript project for a while now. Um, but with action text, it, it kind of takes Trix and then adds a whole backend Rails layer that you can use out of the box to, to make rich text just seamlessly work. Uh, Trix looks like this. So, you know, everything looks really nice and you can add in images with captions and you can format and do a bunch of stuff like that. And, you know, it works well on mobile devices as well as desktop machines. Uh, and it's really easy to get started. So you run a one-time command that just sets up uh, the, the database migrations you need and it uses Yarn to, to add uh, the, uh, the package for tricks. And then uh, in your model, like say message, you can just say has rich text content. And then uh, for your form, it's just a one line, just like you'd say text field or checkbox or whatever. You can just say rich text area. And that's it. That's all you have to do to add rich text editing to your form. And then in your view layer, you can just, you know, add a one liner to your ERB file at message.content and you're done. That displays it and it's sanitized and everything's golden. So, you know, there's more to do perhaps if you start getting fancy with adding in, you know, blobs like images and attachments and stuff. But it comes with a bunch of, you know, fac facility for doing that out of the box, which is kind of the, the reason why action text exists. Um, and just a little mention here from the documentation, if you don't like their default styling and you want to overwrite that, you can totally do that. Uh, you can change uh, kind of how, how the HTML is styled for when attachments and these different blobs show up in the content. Uh, so it's, 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 you know, like so much of Rails, you can modify how it works and overwrite things, but, you know, out of the box it just kind of works for you. Parallel testing. So we have all these CPU cores. We have these big beefy machines and we want our test suites to not take forever if we have a large code base. And so this is pretty cool. Uh, all you have to do is add one line to your uh, test uh, helper file and um, you know, just give it a number, parallelize. And uh, whatever that number is, you can actually overwrite when you run your test command. So if you want you know, set up a CI to run a whole bunch of workers all at once, you can do that. Uh, and another interesting thing is it takes care of automatically basically setting up the test database independently for each worker. So each worker gets their own database with its, you know, starting up the schema and letting it run. So that way there's, you know, not collision. Because you can imagine if you have a bunch of parallel test workers, if they're all hitting the same test database and trying to figure out like, Oh, is the count of this thing I just did like three records? Like, no, because this other worker's been doing stuff too. Ah, no. So every every worker gets its own database to work in. Uh, and I'm not quite sure the nuances between the two ways that the workers can be created. It can either fork a new process for each worker or it can use threads. If you're on JRuby, you have to use threads, but for the rest of us, it defaults to forking. Um, and if you are using it in the forking configuration, there's a callback here, parallelize setup and parallelize test down, or tear down, sorry. And um, if you need to do something in those callbacks, you can. But that's not available with threads. I'm not sure why, anyway, uh, look up the documentation on that to, to find out more. Um, real quick with Action Cable, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Action Cable. I know it, it's had a little bit of a mm, feeling about it since it came out because in certain cases you can run into like lots of weirdness around how it runs on different servers or it's hard to debug or whatever. Um, but hopefully that last part's better now because there's a bunch of new test features available for Action Cable so you can write tests around, you know, subscribing to a channel, publishing to a channel, 
making sure the right messages are getting routed to the right places, so that can all be part of your test suite. Uh, and Action Cable itself is more modern now with, with ES6 rather than CoffeeScript. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, I, I was starting to get annoyed where I'd start a new Rails project and I wouldn't have any coffee script anywhere and as soon as I add Action Cable, it's like, I don't want that here, what's going on? Uh, so, so this is good news. Uh, speaking of JavaScript, Webpacker is indeed the default. Every Rails new just brings in Webpacker. And um, so, you know, really, if you have not looked into Webpacker, if you're still in Sprocket's world, this is the time. Seize the day and, uh, and learn how Webpacker works. And um, Sprockets is still around. If you upgrade an older Rails app to Rails 6, it doesn't change anything. It'll still let you use Sprockets for everything. But for a new Rails app, it defaults to using Webpacker. Um, so, the, there is a dumb thing about this though. I don't know why, but they're like, where's the guide? Where's the, the tutorial? Where's the information on the guides.rubyonrails.org site for Webpacker? Like, where is it? Bueller, Bueller? Who wants to write it? <laughs> well, that, the thing is they've, they've written it all. It's just not on the guides. So, it, I don't know. It, if you go to Rails slash Webpacker, there's a bunch of documentation there right in the GitHub repo. They, they could basically just import that into guides and, it, and you're good. I don't know why they haven't done that yet, but Sounds yeah, like check that out. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Somebody's got to do it. Um, but yeah, when you create a new Rails app, you can just do dash dash webpack equals and you, so you can get started with React or Stimulus. Uh, there, there's options for Elm, Angular, pretty sure there's Ember. Uh, stimulus, which I use a lot. I love stimulus. Uh, so anyway, like it's just really easy to get started with that. And um, you know, when you run something like uh, Rails assets precompile in production, uh, it automatically does yarn install and compiles all the Webpack stuff as well as any Sprocket stuff that you might have, and just everything just just happens automatically, which is great. Um, oh yeah, and I mentioned I, I do prefer to use the Webpacker tooling and stuff, sprockets for CSS. Uh, and it's really easy. So as you can see here in your application.js pack file, you can just have a one-liner that says, you know, import a CSS file or, or in this case SCSS file from some other folder. Like I, I just do app slash styles to make it easy. Uh, so there's an application C, uh, SCSS file and styles there. And then in that file, I just import, you know, like a fr CSS framework like Bulma or you, you could do Bootstrap or Foundation or Tailwind or whatever you want to do. Uh, just import it there and get started. And then in your layout file, just like you would have JavaScript pack tag for the, the initial web pack that you want to import, uh, you would have style sheet pack tag and, and that's it. So basically it's as easy to use that as it would your CSS in the, in the old asset pipeline via sprockets. So I'm doing this because, you know, I work a lot on Jekyll sites too, and on Jekyll uh, I have Webpack set up for all my JavaScript and SCSS stuff there. So, you know, even, even if I'm doing a Jekyll site, if I'm doing a Rails site, if I'm even doing like a fully JavaScript site like React and Next.js and all this stuff, like whatever environment I'm in, the front end kind of works the same, which I'm just, I really love that. Zwork. I'm sorry for you Kraftwerk fans. This is not a new album from Kraftwerk. <laughs> Wish it were, but no. Zwork is a new autoloader for Rails 6, and I'm not entirely sure all of the reasons why there needed to be a new autoloader. But uh, from what I've heard, the old autoloader was, you know, a lot of kind of older crafty code that had a million workarounds for every little edge case and even, you know, even with that, there were strange little things that could happen here or there. Uh, so anyway, uh, folks over at Shopify just worked on a whole new uh, system here that um, presumably is, you know, more modern and faster and works better and all that. Um, 
Interesting thing about it is it works backwards from the old autoloader. So the way the old one worked would be, was that um, you know in your code when you'd reference you know the name of a model or a controller or you know different different classes you have in your Rails app, uh, it would take that and then it would go look for the file and try to find the file you know with the file name and folder structure that matches what you're referencing. Uh, Zwork does the opposite. It goes through your entire file structure. All the folders. It looks through, you know, controllers and models and all the different places. All the, everything in your auto load path, and then it, you know, basically comes up with a tree internally of of all those different constants. And so then, when you use a constant, it already knows which file to 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 load up for that. Um, so, for the most part, it'll work exactly the same. Everything will be transparent. You won't, won't notice any differences. Um, but if you look at the documentation for it, it does mention there are certain things that can be weird, like if you have a class that's like foo, all uppercase, that used to work and now it doesn't and it explains why. So there's like a couple little differences, but for the vast majority of us just doing things like, you know, admin, payments controller, or user's helper, all the sort of standard types of things you create in Rails apps, uh, it'll just work the same, but better. And finally, coming soon to a developer console near you. This is not in Rails 6, but it's coming soon in Rails 1, and that is Action View Component. Woohoo! Cheers! Yay! Yeah. All right, I'll tell you why I'm so excited. So you you will all be cheering along with me. So if you've done any work in the sort of front end world like with React and so forth and, and worked with design systems in larger companies and increasingly smaller companies now. Everything's about components, components, components and design thinking and so you know the idea is that when you look at your, your page, when you look at your interface, you know everything is a component you know from the tiniest little button all the way to the you know the largest screen with panels and tabs and whatever different things you have going on. And you know all of those different pieces of your page are supposed to be kind of encapsulated and testable, and you know one doesn't affect the other, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so that's kind of what's been happening on the front end. But then when you go back to sort of bog standard Rails app with you know ERB files and partials, you know you you kind of lose some enforcement of that. You know you can build everything as if it's a component just with standard Rails tech. Um, but it doesn't really enforce anything. So this is a way to enforce that. And this is coming from the folks at GitHub. So they're, they're already uh, building or rebuilding sort of all their Rails view layer stuff into these types of components. Uh, so the way it works is first you create what is basically just a Ruby object, uh, put it in app slash components. So we have test component here. Uh, it accepts uh, content and a title variable and it validates those. So those are required variables for the component and when it initializes it just you know, stores that title and that can be read out later. Pretty simple. Uh, then you write a view partial that goes along with that Ruby object. So here it's just you know, a little bit HTML, it spits out the title and content. And then the way you use that in the parent view, the way you render that component is with Render. So just like you would render a partial, you would actually render this component object or you know the class here. You just pass it along to render, give it a title, and then content is just what's inside the block there. So, so that you know that parent view renders the component, and then the component is responsible for you know doing whatever it does to, to validate the data and transform it and do things to it, and then and then renders itself out. And the cool thing about this kind of thing is, you know, because it has something like validation, if you try to render this component out and, it, and the title's blank or nil or whatever, uh, it's going to raise an error. So in the old days, you know, you might have a partial that just kind of silently fails and you don't really know what's going on because it's just, it's not complaining that the data isn't in a state it's expecting. But here you can really enforce that through validation. Uh, and I don't show it here, but there's a, there's a way to test that as well. So you can add to your test suite a test for each component 
So you can, you know, try out different permutations like what if we pass this kind of data or that kind of data and then check what HTML gets rendered and it's, it's just encapsulated for this one component. You don't have to test like your whole page or what the controller's doing or any of that kind of stuff. So basically all the thinking that would go into creating components with something like React on the front end, you can take that same thinking and do it just with server rendered HTML in the Rails way. So that's really neat. Uh, if you really want to check it out and you can't wait for Rails 6.1, uh, GitHub actually has it up. And I didn't even realize, to be honest, until today when I was finishing up the presentation that they actually do have this available. So right now, just Rails 6, uh, you, can, uh, you can grab this, uh, this gem off of GitHub's repo and start check checking it out. So I'm gonna start doing that. I'm gonna try it out. Um, I'm, I think this is a, a, a really cool new uh, addition to you know, the, the, the server rendered Rails uh, world that we're used to, to give it some of the benefits that otherwise you'd have to just go all the way over to something like React to, to get. Now we can do it on the server side. So let's recap. What we've learned, Rails isn't dead yet. <laughs> no, Rails is doing fine. Shopify and GitHub are contributing mightily to Rails, so they've done a you know, bunch to help shape up Rails 6, and they're just continuing to just full steam ahead on future versions. And you know, obviously there's tons of other contributors around the world to Rails, um, as well as, you know, as these larger companies. Uh, so, interesting thing about you know, them running on Rails Master kind of makes me think like, well, if Shopify and GitHub can <laughs> run these massive like web scale uh, you know, technology platforms off of Rails Master, uh, maybe we should all try doing that. Uh, I'm gonna start thinking through what it would mean for some of the projects I work on to, to sort of upgrade early and often. And, you know, obviously you have to have good tests for that. Uh, so we got Action Mailbox, Action Text, those are the, the marquee new frameworks. Uh, for databases, you can have multiple databases, both for like primary and replica type uh, arrangements, as well as having different models stored in different databases. So you can do like sharding kind of stuff, which is really cool. Uh, lots of new active record stuff, which we'll hear more about shortly in the next lightning talk. Uh, and then some other sort of smaller but also cool things like uh, parallel tests, uh, web packers on by default, new autoloader, Zwerk. Um, and there's just like a ton of little things. I mean, it, it really is a big release, so I do encourage you to go to uh, guides.rubyonrails.org and look at the, you know, like the what's new and the release notes and upgrading from Rails 5 to Rails 6. There's a bunch of info, you know, all along those lines. <laughs> yeah, gotta get that webpacker stuff in there. And then uh, stay tuned for all that component stuff coming in 6.1. Woohoo! Woo! Woo! Oh. Yeah. Uh, that's all I got for today. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Thanks, Jared. Do we have time for questions or? Okay. We got a few minutes probably for some questions. Uh, I am available for hire through my uh, little boutique web studio if you have any kind of project where you need a, another pair of eyes or know somebody that's building some new app or whatever, uh, feel free to get in touch. If you want to watch this presentation again for reference, you can go to rails6.whitefusion.design. Uh, I built this in Jekyll along with a cool little JavaScript tool called Remark and there's source code for that as well if you're interested. Uh, I actually couldn't find that good of a like starter template for Jekyll and Remark together, so I had to put it together. So hopefully other people can benefit from it. Um, yeah, so any questions about Rails 6 or Rails in general? Or Ruby? <laughs> or Portland? No, I'm just kidding. All right, well thank you. <laughs> Thank you.